guys, welcome back. Today what I want to do is continue kind of what we were talking about the other day. And I want to start with some pictures of some constellations. And then on Blackboard, I have the mythology that goes along with those constellations. And I think that that will help you once you see the mythology to go ahead and really see why the constellations are placed in the sky the way they are. Now, sometimes those constellations work really well relative to what they're supposed to be. Sometimes you kind of wonder what's going on. But let's look at one of the constellations that is always up, and that's the Big Dipper. And you know that the Big Dipper is in the north part of the sky, and the Big Dipper has the two stars, the pointer stars, that point toward Polaris, which is the star that right now the end appears that the entire universe is turning around. Now remember that it's a circumpolar constellation star, or constellation, so that it's always visible, no matter where you are, what part of the year you're talking about. Now what it will do is it will go ahead and circulate around Polaris. Now one of the more common or uh, constellations that you're going to see in the summer is Cygnus. Cygnus is, Cygnus is swan. A lot of times it's simply called the Northern Cross. And you can see in this picture here that it's sitting in the Milky Way itself. Now, we'll come back to the Milky Way relative to the fact that it's one of the spiral arms of our galaxy, but more importantly, if I look through either a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you're going to be able to see there's a lot more stars within that concentration of the Milky Way, as opposed to either above or below that. Now, if you look and you see the constellation Orion, then I want you to concentrate on Orion's sword, and you see right in the center of that, it's kind of that pinkish color. Well, if we were able to look through a telescope, then you're going to see something that looks a little bit more like this, as well as like this. And that's the trapezium, or the center portion of the Orion Nebula. So, we want to be able to use telescopes to enhance our view of the universe. Well, when you look up, you can see approximately 3,000 to 6,000 stars with your unaided eye. Now, that does make the assumption that you're out far away from the city lights, and you don't have to worry about that and that you go ahead and let your eyes become dark adapted. Now, again, I encourage you to certainly head out. And if you take a flashlight with you, that's a good idea. But please make sure that it has a red cellophane covering on it. Otherwise, what happens is you get out there, your eyes get dark adapted, you turn this flashlight on, which is all this nice white light that comes out, and it completely destroys your night vision. So make sure you have that flashlight covered with red cellophane. And that will then go ahead and allow you to keep that night vision when you use your uh, flashlight. So now, let's go ahead and look at telescopes. Now, I know you're saying, wait a minute, that's not a telescope, that's a Stonehenge. Well, guys, the Stonehenge really was an ancient observatory, just not using the kind of light telescopes as you expect to see today. But it certainly was used to look at the movement of the stars through the sky, as well as being able to predict the eclipses. I'm going to show you a couple other ancient observatories, one of them in the United States and one of them over in um, China, and then one of them down in southern South America. And all of those were used then to observe patterns in the sky and to observe certain times of the year when certain either stars were at a certain position, when they were coming up, when they were going down. All of those then served to act as observatories, just not necessarily an observatory with a telescope in it the way that we normally think of it. Okay, this is one of the big observatories down in South America. And then this one is a telescope that's over from China. Now, the most important function of a telescope is to basically collect the light and not only collect the light, but you've got to be able to focus it into an image. An image that you can see very sharp. And so the light that can be collected from that telescope ranges over the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So we're going from radio waves all the way up to gamma radiation. Most of what people think about when they think about telescopes are optical telescopes, the telescopes then that are using light in the optical range, the kinds that our eye then goes ahead and sees. Now, the largest telescopes in the world are reflecting telescopes. We're going to have two types of optical telescopes, ones that are made of lenses, ones that are made of mirrors. What you find out is that glass you don't think it's a solid, but it really will over a period of time run. And so you want to be able to support that mirror from below. And so that's why the largest telescopes right now in the world are made from mirrors and not from lenses. And like I said, until recently, the largest telescope was the Mount Held Telescope in California, and it was a 200-inch telescope. So 
So what does that mean? Well, we're really talking about the diameter of the telescope at that point, the diameter of the central mirror. Today, by looking at a different format for making a telescope, as well as making smaller mirrors and putting all those mirrors together, then we can achieve a much larger optical surface than what we have done before. Now, this is an example of one of the newer telescopes where now you're looking at two telescopes that are actually working together. Now, the light gathering ability of a telescope is determined by the area of the device that's collecting the light. So if you think about the mirror or the lens or whatever we're looking at, the greater that area, the greater the ability for that to go ahead and collect light. Now, so when we talk about the aperture of that optical telescope, then that's referring to the diameter. Remember, guys, diameter is the distance across that nice circle that you're looking at. And as the diameter doubles, the light that you're collecting increases by about four times. Now, the other thing you worry about when you're talking about a telescope is the resolution. Remember I said that you're wanting to make sure that you can really focus that light down? Well, resolution really refers to the fineness of the detail that's going to be present in the image. It's not going to help to be able to look at an image that's, you know, really far away. It is just a really fuzzy image. You know, fuzziness is nice for appropriate, you know, at certain times. But you really want a nice, sharp focus if you want to see what's going on. So the resolution can be thought of as the smallest degree of separation that can be seen between two point sources at some distance. You know, how far can I resolve the fact that, you know, I have two candles that are sitting right beside each other and I can resolve them into two candles as opposed to one that kind of looks like shining with their combined light. Well, the best telescopes can resolve an image of a quarter at a distance of a little bit over three miles. Well, think about that, guys. If I take a regular quarter, I put it at distance of three miles, I can still see that image very clearly. You know, that's quite a bit, and that's what we want to be able to do to be able to look at what's going on out in the sky. Now, we also have telescopes that have adaptive optics, and they help bring the resolution of that telescope as light then goes ahead and enters or passes through the atmosphere of the Earth. Think about what you have. You have a nice summer day, you go outside at night, you're looking up at the sky, and things are just a little hazy. Well, You've had that day, which has gone ahead and heated the atmosphere. The atmosphere then has a lot of motion, and that motion still exists after the sun goes down. As you can see here, I've got some clouds. I've got the motion of the atmosphere in there. And so if I'm looking at that light coming from the star, it goes through then the atmosphere, which is in motion. It makes that image appear much larger than what it really is. And so the other thing is that completely makes that focus of that object go away. And so here's an image of two pictures. One of them you can see that has gone through the scintillation of the atmosphere, has gone through the atmosphere itself. The other one has had those adaptive optics taking care of it, and you can see how much better that image is on the right than the one on the left. So what you do is you just go ahead and put those optics on the front part of your telescope, and that is taken care of as that image then comes into you and then goes through the telescope itself much better to be able to do those kinds of things than what you had before. In some cases, if you didn't have that adoptive optics, optics, excuse me guys, you'd just have to completely go ahead and turn it in for the evening. You couldn't be able to see anything. Because there's no reason to be able to try and take, let's say, a spectrum of that star if that image is so large that you just can't get any detail out of it. So remember, most of these large telescopes are not used just to look at objects. They are looking at the light, they're looking at the spectrum. They're doing a variety of things as opposed to just looking at how gorgeous they are out in the sky. Now, something else that you want to know about a telescope is called the magnification. It's defined as the focal length of the objective divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. Okay, right now, I know you don't know what the focal length is, but give me a few minutes and we're going to come back to that. Now, the objective is the lens of the mirror that's going to be in front of the telescope, and then the eyepiece is a lens of the mirror that's closest to your eye. And I've got some pictures of some telescopes here that we're going to look at, and we'll talk about where the objective is relative to the eyepiece. Like I said, we're going to come back to focal length here real shortly when I talk about going ahead and forming images within lenses and mirrors. Okay, quick guys, who is that? Well, hopefully you told me it's Galileo. And you see some of Galileo's early telescopes laying there in front of him. Now, Galileo, as we've talked before, did not invent the telescope, but he certainly was one of the first ones to use that telescope to look up in the sky. 
We've talked about some of the things that Galileo saw when we talked about the ancient astronomers earlier. This is one of the more modern telescopes. Now, this does use lens as opposed to mirrors. So this is called a refracting telescope and not a reflecting telescope. Now, kind of hard to figure out what's going on right there, but if I show you this telescope, you can see that there is a person in the lower left hand. Well, he is looking through the eyepiece of that, and that means that the other end, which is at the upper right then, is where your objective is. And so the light comes through that lens, it gets brought down and focused then into the eyepiece, and then that's what the person looks through. A lot of times, instead of having a person there, especially for these larger telescopes, then you'll put an instrument, either a photometer, a spectrometer, or something on there to go ahead and record that light and to basically be able to analyze that light. So remember, guys, these are refracting telescopes. Refraction means that we are looking at light as it passes through a particular material. In this case, that material is glass. So what does a refracting telescope look like? Okay, if I took that telescope you just saw and I laid it out flat, you can see that on the right side I have what's called an objective lens. So that means that the light's going to be coming from the right side through the lens itself. It gets focused down into something called a diagonal, and all that diagonal does is go ahead and allow the light to be reflected up through an eyepiece. So in this case, there's a little diagonal that allows the eyepiece you know, to be in top, whereas where you looked at it here, there was no diagonal in there. The light just came straight through. Now notice the blue part is just the light that's coming from that star. Okay, the next one looks more like that refracting telescope that I showed you earlier. You've got the objective lens, there's your eyepiece. The light comes through and it goes ahead and gets focused then, and then when you look through that, you can see whatever the image that you're looking at. Now, if we're looking at a star, it doesn't really matter whether the star is right side up or upside down. Okay, and I want you to hold that thought because when we look at formation of lenses, we're going to come back to the idea of when I look at a star, am I looking at it right side up or am I looking at it upside down? So now, when we talk about then forming that lens, forming that image, what I would like to do next is go through a series of slides that talk about image formation relative to looking at refraction. Now guys, if you will go to Blackboard and pull off, I have both the lenses as well as the mirrors. And we're only going to go through the lenses today, and then I'm going to have you do some things with the mirrors. So if you have not gone ahead and pulled off the diagrams of what's going on with those lenses, do so now and then come back. Okay, so let's talk about image formation. There are two different types of lenses and mirrors. One of them is called a converging lens or mirror. One of them is called a diverging. Now, converging, think about what the word converging means, brings everything to a point. Diverging spreads everything out. When we talk about converging, we can talk about either a concave mirror or a convex lens. And the ones that we're going to go through today deal with lenses. Diverging, on the other hand, like I said, spreads all the light out. And we're then talking about a concave lens or a convex mirror. Now notice, guys, they're always, when we talk about lenses and mirrors, everything we say for one applies to the other only in the opposite. So a converging mirror is a concave. A converging lens is a convex lens. Diverging lens is a concave lens. Diverging mirror is a convex. Again, notice the opposite. Now, we can also talk about something called real images and virtual images. Real images are images that can be projected. Virtual images are images that just appear to be there but really aren't. Okay, let's say you got up this morning. Hopefully you looked in the mirror. Okay, and let's say you're looking just in a nice flat mirror. You look at yourself in that mirror and you're right side up. You're about the same size that you are out here. Okay? Now, if you looked at a shaving mirror or a makeup mirror and you did the same thing, you're going to get a little bit different image. One of the reasons you use shaving mirrors or makeup mirrors is because they give you a magnified view of yourself. That magnified view is right side up. Okay? And you're going to find out that virtual images are always in the same orientation as what your object is, whereas real images are always in an inverted orientation. I'll show you what that means here in just a second because we're going to produce some images and show you how they're formed. Now, I'm going to break down these lenses 
in some six cases. And you'll also notice, guys, that you have a sheet on there in Blackboard that lists these cases as well and kind of fills in all the information as we go through. So we're going to start with an object at infinity, and we're going to move it closer then to see what happens. Now, most of what you do in astronomy, you are looking at objects at infinity. But I still feel like it's important to understand how those images change as you bring the object toward the lens or toward the mirror. So that's why I'm still going to go ahead and include the other cases. Now, I'm not ever going to have you actually having to draw these images out, but I do at least want you to get a feel for how you would find them. Now, if we have an object at infinity, so you're looking at a star, then we're making the assumption that the light from that star is essentially coming into us parallel. Okay? That star is so far away that all the light's coming in parallel. Well, if I go ahead and look at my lens here, and by the way, I've only got one lens, so this is not a combination. This is just one right now. I have a convex lens in the center, and notice that I have two dots on either side. One of them I've labeled F, and one of them I've labeled C. And the two Fs that you see are the same distance from the lens, and the two Cs are the same distance. Well, F stands for what we call the focal point. And the focal point is defined as where the image is formed when the object is at infinity. Now, it really has to do with the curvature of the lens that you are seeing, things like that. Because if I look at the other letter that I have down there, C, that's called the center of curvature. Okay, center of curvature is basically the radius of the circle, of the arc, the part of the circle that has formed the lens or the mirror. And the relationship between F and C is that C is twice F. So if you think about what the diameter of a mirror is, the diameter of a circle, okay, the diameter of a circle is the entire length of cross. The radius is half the diameter and goes from the center out. Well, then if I would take that radius and divide it by 2, I'm going to get the focal length. Okay. Hopefully that's making sense. If it doesn't, make sure we talk about that. Okay, so I'm going to go back to case number 1, and my object is at infinity. So I'm looking at a star through a telescope. And when I do that, all my light rays are coming in parallel. Now, there's also, notice where I've got the C and the F and the C and the F. That's what's called the principal axis. So that comes straight through the lens. So it's really doing the same thing as all the rest of the light rays are doing, just coming straight in. Now, remember I said that the focal length is defined as where the image is formed when the object is at infinity. So for a convex lens, and we are assuming that this is a thin lens, and I've had to go ahead and make it a little bit larger and wider simply because of the fact that I want to be able to show you that. But guys, notice that a convex lens does have the middle thicker than what the ends are. Okay, so for a convex lens, okay, my middle is thicker than the ends. So now, let's see what happens when I take those light rays through the lens. Remember, they are refracted, and notice they all cross at the focal point. Okay, so they come through the lens, they all cross at the focal point. And so right there is where my image is formed. Now, so my star is at infinity. And if I put then an eyepiece there, your eye there, whatever you want, then you're going to have an image that you're going to see of that star right at that point. Now, remember I also said that real images can be projected. Real images are really there. OK, that's if I put your finger there and I'm looking at an object called the sun, then I guarantee you your finger is going to go ahead and burn. Think about what you might have done if you were a sadistical child with a magnifying lens. Okay, you go outside and you got your little brother or little sister there with you and it's a really nice bright sunny day. And so you take that magnifying lens and you see your little brother or sister's finger there and you go ahead and focus that sunlight on that little finger. I guarantee you your little brother or sister is going to say, ouch, because it's going to hurt, because there's energy that is really there. Now, you guys are not sadistical children, I'm sure, so you never did that. Correct? Well, if you had, that's where that was forming. But the other thing I want you to notice, not only is the energy really there, okay, if I think about that star and I look at the, in, the light rays that are at the very top of that lens, notice they are projected down. When they come in, through that focal point, they go down. The ones at the bottom go up. Everything is inverted for a real image. Okay. Now, let's look at what happens if I don't have my object at infinity. 
let's say I have my object beyond C. And so the other thing that we use F and C, F being the focal point, C being the center of curvature or twice the focal length, is we use it as reference points. So I now have an object, and notice that I have that object just as a nice kind of tall arrow right through there. Now that tip of that arrow, as well as all the rest of the arrow, is, is an object that has light coming from it. And so the only thing I'm worried about is I want to know where the top of that arrow is formed. So I'm going to take two light rays from the top of the arrow and I'm going to determine where they are formed as they go through then the lens. And wherever those two cross is where then my tip of the arrow is going to be on the other side. Now realize guys that there's an infinite number of light rays coming from that arrow but I really only need to use two to determine where a point is. Okay. Now remember from what we just did previously if I have a light ray coming in parallel it goes through the focal point. So let's do that. Got a light ray coming in parallel, you know that it's going to go through the focal point. Well, I can do the same thing in reverse. If I have a light ray coming from the top of the arrow, it goes through the focal point, it's going to come out parallel. Okay, so let's do that. Goes through the focal point, it's going to come out parallel. Wherever they meet is where the top of that arrow is. Now, the bottom of the arrow is on the principal axis, so we know that it's going to stay on the principal axis as it goes through. Notice that I put a small little red arrow there, and that's going to represent my image. Now, the first thing you want to ask yourself, is it real or is it virtual? Well, it's a real image because the light rays really do cross there. If I put a piece of paper or your eye or whatever right there, I would get an image that I could see that was in focus at that point. So now we come through, notice that my object was beyond C, beyond that center of curvature. Notice that my image is formed between F and C. So I've brought my object in closer, and at least from case one to case two, it looks like my image is moving out. So I bring my object in closer, my image is moving out. Because before, when everything was in parallel, or everything was at infinity, my image was formed at F. So let's see what happens with case three. The object is going to be at C. Well, I do the same thing. I bring one in parallel. It goes out through F, in through F, out parallel. Wow, guys. It looks like that image is formed right at C. And that's the only time that you're going to have your image and your object at the same position. Not only are you going to have them at the same position, you're going to have them at the same size. If I would actually take a small ruler and I would measure the height of my image on the right side, excuse me, the height of my object on the right side, that would be the height of my image on the left side. So let's go ahead and bring my object in closer. Remember, closer and closer and closer to the lens. See what happens. So now I'm between F and C. Same thing, guys, bring them in parallel, out through F, in through F, out parallel. Notice that they crossed way beyond C. So there's my image. Also, guys, notice the height difference between my object and my image. It certainly seems to be getting larger. So now, let's go ahead and put our object at F and see what happens to our image. Okay, so I go in parallel, out through F, certainly makes sense. Now let me go in through F. Hmm, how do I go in through F? That doesn't make any sense. If I draw in through F, I go straight down. Guess what guys, do those ever actually go ahead and cross? And they don't. And so when you have an object right at F, you're never going to form an image. Okay? You're just going to kind of like be like a big blur right there. And so F then seems to be some kind of transition point. Okay? When we had our object infinity, beyond C, at C, between F and C, we all went ahead and had real images. Okay? They started from very, very tiny to very large. And yet when I had my object at F, no image is going to be formed. So, now let's see what happens when the object is between F and the lens. Okay, I do the same thing. I come in parallel, out through F. 
Now, in terms of drawing it, you still want to come in through F so that I can go out parallel. And so notice how I've come in through F. And remember, these are both coming from the tip of the arrow itself. So I come in through F, and it's going to go out parallel. Now, those two don't appear to meet either. Those are the refracted rays. They do not meet. But you can see that they do appear to diverge. So what happens if I would go ahead and follow them back? So I'm going to do that with dotted lines. Now notice that I am following back the refracted light rays. And they appear to meet someplace behind. And so there's my image, like we've always done before, only this time, guys, notice the image is not real. It only appears to be there. And it's also formed, in this case, on the same side as what your object is. Now, think back to using a magnifying lens. One of the reasons that you use a magnifying lens is so that you can magnify your image. Excuse me, so you can magnify your object. Okay, so if I look at my object, then I'm going to get a magnified image, and that's exactly what you're seeing here with case number six. That's a virtual image. It is in the same orientation as what your object is. And notice it is larger. And that's one of the ways that we're always going to be able to tell the difference in virtual images, whether they're formed from a convex lens or a concave lens. Is a convex lens will always form a virtual image that is larger than the object. Okay. So now let's go look at the table that I talked about. Well, I've got everything filled in to just kind of remind you of what then the characteristics were. If I have an object at infinity, my image distance is at F. If I have like case number two is between C or beyond C, then my image distance is between C and F. If it's at C, then the image is at C. If it's between C and F, then my image distance is beyond C. If my object is right at F, there's no image. And then if it's between F and the lens, it's going to be then in front of the lens as opposed to behind. Okay, which is what the real ones are. Now, guys, I want you to keep in mind the same kind of chart when you guys actually look at the mirror as opposed to the lenses. Then you can see I've got the relative height of the images. Okay, for case number one, it's the smallest. Case number four is the largest for the real images, and I have no image. And then it's the largest for the virtual image. As long as it's a real image, it's always inverted. So one through four produces real images. Number six produces a virtual image. Virtual images are right side up as opposed to inverted. And if you think about the brightness of the image, okay, if I take that image brightness and I put it over the smallest area, then it's got to be the brightest image you're going to have. And then as that image gets larger, then obviously the image is going to get dimmer. So that's case one through six for converging lenses. Remember, converging lenses are convex lenses. Now, we also have concave lenses. Notice the appearance of this concave lens. It's thicker at the ends than what it is at the center, which means this is going to be a diverging lens. So I'm going to do just two cases here. I'm going to case one, the object at infinity, and case two, where the object is not at infinity, and we're not going to worry about all the other ones in between. Now, remember case number one, object at infinity, means that all the light rays are coming in parallel. So let's pull out, put all those light rays in on parallel. Now, for a convex lens, remember they all went through F. Well, they're all going to appear to come from F for this one. So let me show you what I mean by that. Notice that we're looking at that focal point on the same side that you have the object. Okay, There's one of them. There's a second one. There's a third one. And there's the fourth one. So they appear to come from that point, that focal point, on the same side as the object. They go through the lens and they spread out. That also means that I have a virtual image formed right at the focal point. Now, let's go back to thinking about the idea that we talked about with the magnification of a telescope, focal length of the objective over the focal length of the eyepiece. Well, we've kind of looked at the focal length all along, but I haven't really defined it. 
the focal length is the distance between the focal point and either the lens or the mirror. And that is determined solely by the curvature of the lens or the mirror. So it's not determined by where the object or the image is formed. So we've got a very small image here. But it is a virtual image, and I think you can see that it's still going to be right side up. Okay. Now, let's look at the second case where the object is not at infinity. And so notice I did the same thing as I did before. This time, guys, I'm not really worrying about the center of curvature. The only two things that I worry about are those focal points. So I've got my ob object right there. It comes in parallel. And as we saw before, it appears to come from F and spread out. My second one appears like it's coming from F on the other side. OK, so notice that I gave you the red one. OK, but in reality, guys, it appears like it's heading from to down toward that F. Because remember, if it heads toward F, then it's going to go out parallel. And so that's exactly what happens here. It goes out parallel. Well, just like I did before, I'm going to go ahead and follow those two back because they appear to be diverging. And when I do, right there is where my image is formed. Notice that that image is smaller than your object. It's a virtual image, so that means it's in the same orientation as what your object is. And if it is from a concave lens, then that means it's always going to be smaller. Now, when we talk about telescopes, what we do is we put together lenses, either concaves and convexes or two convexes. And you're going to have a small little um, experiment that I'm going to have you do, a website that I'm going to have you go to, that will help you build a telescope, in this case a refracting telescope, by putting combinations of two convex lenses together as well as a convex and concave lens. And I want you to look at then what happens to the image when you look at it. Is it right side up? Is it upside down? In other words, is it real or is it virtual? Now, what you're going to find out, at least for the two convex lenses, it's always going to be a virtual image. Excuse me. It's always going to be a real image, which means that your image is going to be upside down. But do we really worry about, if we're looking at a star, whether that star is right side up or upside down? And you really don't. Where it might become more important is if you're looking at the moon, and so when you look at a lot of the maps of the moons, the maps of the moons will be inverted so that when you look at the map of the moon, you're actually seeing the moon the way that you're seeing it through a telescope, which is inverted. And so it's not that they just made those maps wrong. It's just they made the maps so that they go ahead and follow the appearance of the moon in the telescope. Now, let's switch from a refracting telescope to a reflecting telescope. Reflecting telescopes are going to go ahead and use mirrors, and I've stated before, the largest telescopes in the world will tend to be reflecting telescopes because you can go ahead and support the mirror from behind. And so you see the light from the object, it comes in, it hits the mirror, that's a darker blue part, it hits that reflecting mirror, just that diagonal like you saw before on the refracting telescopes, so that it'll go up through the eyepiece. Remember, the magnification of a telescope is defined as the focal length of the objective over the focal length of the eyepiece. And so when you go look at that website, you'll have a chance then to make those telescopes. And you can go ahead and switch out lenses and mirrors, things like that, and then see what happens to the image that is produced and to the magnification of that image. Here's another type of telescope. Um, where now you've got that animation just like you had before. You've got the little diagonal in there, the secondary mirror, to go ahead and flip it up to the eyepiece. Now this is up to, you know, several years ago. This is the Hell Telescope, which was at one point the largest telescope in the world. Now when a lot of people look at this, the first thing they see is they think they see the telescope, and they're really looking at the yoke. So the solid part that you see in this picture is the yoke of the telescope. That's what holds it and gives it the orientation that it needs. The actual telescope is that lattice work that you see behind you. And I put this picture in there uh, to give you an idea of the scale of how large that is, because you've got this group of people that they are lecturing to. And right above that, you can see the mirror. That's the primary mirror. And they, remember, that primary mirror is 200 inches across. That's a diameter. And this is one piece of glass you know, that is 200 inches across. 
and then it, the light itself gets reflected up to that small little primary mirror, which is up at the top of this a little bitty cage within the lattice structure itself. And I've got a better picture of it nowadays. No, nowadays, unfortunately, they don't go ahead and do those types of lectures that they used to. Um, you can see the white yoke, which is a holder for it, as well as helps in align it. And then you see the telescope itself with that lattice work. You see that white mirror is a primary mirror. And then up at the top, you see the lattice work for the mirror that holds the primary and the secondary mirror then in place. And you see a small, yellow, uh, small uh, silver, uh, what appears like a cylinder up there. That's then where that secondary mirror is. That's where that eyepiece is. This one you don't you normally use for just visually looking at something. Generally, you have a photographic plate there, or you have, you know, photography that you're, or photometry that you're looking at, or a spectrum that you're looking at. Very rarely do you actually get to sit there and actually look at something without having an instrument placed there. Now, when you have these big, large telescopes, you always have a dome, okay? And that is the dome for the 200 inch, and the dome is there for several things. Number one, to protect the telescope when it's out there in an open space. I mean, you don't really want, let's say, a bird to come by and do anything drastic to your telescope. But the other thing that it does, it also helps stabilize the air so that you don't have any kind of movement, things like that. You can kind of get an idea of size. You can see the, the trees down here, and you can see the door that lets you in on that. But that's just then the dome for this big telescope. And any telescope of any size will have a dome. One of the th things that I want you guys to do, and every semester we go ahead and offer public nights out at the observatory for our uh, observatory at Marshfield. It's about 12 miles north of Marshfield. And so we have two domes out there. Um, possibly a third one, depending on how far along it is and being built. And so it's open to the public, just have a chance to get out there, see what's going on. This is not a lab class, unfortunately, so I can't take you out there. Um, but I would certainly encourage you, and it will be on black when we do have those open houses. You will have to go ahead and ask for a ticket. Tickets are free, but... You know, I remember when we first opened a Baker Observatory years and years ago, I mean, we would have two and 3,000 people out there of an evening when we would have these open houses, and that's just way too many. So we try and limit it, which is why you need a ticket. But generally, if you're taking a class, you definitely can get one of the tickets without any problem. Now, this picture goes ahead, and remember I said that the larger telescopes that we have now are where you have sections of mirrors that get put together, and then they are aligned by a computer, and then they all can go ahead and work in unison. And this is one of the pictures of one of the pieces of the mirrors that then gets fit together in these really large structures that, again, give you a lot more light-gathering power. And size-wise, you can see there's a man in there as they're bringing that mirror up to go ahead and put it in there. Now, this last picture is just a picture of a dome. Remember, guys, you want as much light as you can get, and you want it to go through as small amount of atmosphere as you possibly can. So those observatories tend to be on top of mountains. And you can kind of tell this is on top of a mountain because you can see all those clouds down below. And the other thing you want to do is you want to get them away from the light. So these are usually on far distant mountains, things like that. Okay, now remember I said our observatory is 12 miles north of Marshfield. So we are tending to get landlocked because of all the city lights. Remember when we, again, first opened it, you know, there was not very much light out there at all. Now you can see the lights of Springfield, you can see the lights of Marshfield, you can see the lights of Stratford. You know, it's not nearly as good seeing conditions as what you once have. And that's really a problem worldwide because we are getting so populated that we have so much light pollution that a lot of these big telescopes are just not working to their optimum level because of the light pollution. And so that's why you really do want to go ahead and take them and orbit them around the Earth so you don't have to worry about the light that we're producing down here. Now, this listing gives you several of the other telescopes that we're going to look at. One of them is the Hubble, and a lot of the pictures that you're going to see throughout this entire course are from the Hubble site. Then you've got infrared detectors that are going to detect the heat out there. We've got radio telescopes. Then there's a solar telescope. One of them, Kit Peak, is here on the Earth. The SOHO telescope is in orbit around the sun. And so when we're talking about the sun, a lot of the images I'll show you are from the SOHO telescope. Now, this is the solar telescope at Kit Peak. 
peak. <laughs> it didn't work at all. Get to peak. <laughs> Get that through there. Um, and now, obviously, guys, since this is a solar telescope, that means you can go ahead and use a telescope during the day. Now, there's a big heliostat mirror on there that will go ahead and follow the sun itself, and then it directs the light down that angular tube to real time down there at the bottom. And one of the things that you see when you go to uh, that website there for the Kit Peak is you'll actually get to see images in real time of what the, the images of the sun look like. And it's showing you right there what the astronomers are doing as they work with the images. So it's, you've got a, a live webcam that's right there in the observing room. And so you can kind of come in and see what they're doing, and you'll see them go in and out uh, and do the measurements on the images, things like that. So it's kind of interesting to go ahead and watch. Now, the other big telescope that we have here on the Earth that does not matter because of the light pollution is the big radio telescopes. And this is a big one down that's actually built into the ground at Arecibo. You can see the detector there kind of hanging up there. Well, if you think about it, it's no different than a big mirror. So the light comes in. In this case, it just happens to be the light has really, really long wavelengths of light. So in the form of radio waves, it gets reflected back after that detector, then electronically gets sent into the, the, and I don't know whether you can see, yeah, you can kind of see it on here, uh, looking at those buildings down there, which is where the images then get sent, and a lot of the work gets done. But it's not a visible picture, it's a picture in radio waves. Now if I look at this picture, which is a series of radio telescopes, this is figured prominently in the movie Contact, if you saw Contact with Jodie Foster. This is the very large array out in New Mexico. This is where she first discovered her you know, signal there. But you'll see that all of these telescopes then are big radio telescopes, and they can work together and give you a much better feel then for the image that you're looking at because they can spread that light gathering power out. So guys, if you haven't seen Contact with Jodie Foster, take an evening off, go rent it, look at it, see what you think of it. Now this is the Hubble that's in orbit around the Earth, and so we can not have to worry about any of that light pollution, any of that atmospheric movement, that scintillation, things like that. So you've got a much better view of the sky out there. And remember that when the Hubble first went up, things didn't quite work. It didn't quite have it aligned. It needed to have glasses put on it, and so one of the shuttle missions went up and did. And from now on, we've had phenomenal pictures coming from the Hubble itself. But now the other instrument I want to talk about is you. I mean, you've got eyes. You are also a light gathering instrument. And so I've just got a couple of slides that I want to talk about with your eye and talk about the types of images that you are forming in your eye. So there are six parts of the eye. There's a cornea, there's the iris, the pupil, the lens, the retina, and the optical nerve that go together and allow you to see. Now the cornea, and, and you're looking here at a diagram that shows the eyes you see front on and then the eyes you see kind of sliced in half uh, in use there. If I look at the diagram on the left, you've got your eye there, you've got the eyelids, which are there to basically keep things out of your eye. I've got the iris, so that's the colored part of your eye, the pupil, and the cornea. Now, I would tell you to go look at your eye really close in a mirror. Get as close as you possibly can in a mirror. And you're going to notice that that pupil will expand and contract. And that's what allows the light to go into your eye. It actually is a hole into your eye. I've had students that have dissected, not human eyeballs, but cow eyes and uh, other kinds of deer eyes, things like that. And when you take that cornea off, it really is a hole into the rest of your eye. Okay, and that will expand or contract based on the amount of, of light that you have as well as what your emotions are doing. Okay. Then the cornea, if you look at the cornea from the side, okay, I want to show you this picture and I want you to think about bees. Okay, now think about, there's a cornea, think about that bee, look in where that bee is standing attached to the cornea, Now, normally you don't want that. Remember I said that those eyelashes, go ahead and keep those things out. I don't think there's any way, shape or form I could have handled this picture, but this person did. 
Okay, well that cornea goes ahead and bends then the light as it goes through then into the rest of your eye itself. Okay, and so if I look at it sideways like you see in this diagram, you can see that cornea which is basically nothing more than a really big convex lens. Okay, now the light then comes in through the cornea, it gets bent, and by the way guys, that's what you have surgery on if you have LASIK surgery or anything like that. That's what gets changed is the way that the light is being bent through the cornea. If we have to have cornea transplants and they just take that cornea off and just put a new one back on. Okay, so the light gets bent coming through the cornea. Now, notice what I said guys, the light comes through the cornea, which means we are talking about a real image that's going to be formed on the back of the retina of your eye. Now, once it gets through the cornea, it gets through the pupil, which is that hole that allows the light to enter, it enters the lens. In this case, it's a convex lens, okay? So that means that it's thicker in the center than it is at the ends, which means that the image that you're going to form is gonna be a real image and it's gonna form on the retina of your eye. Now guys, if you think about the retina of your eye, that's the back part of your eye, and there are things called rods and cones down there. Rods help you see black and white, cones help you see color, okay? Your image should be formed then on the retina. That image is a real image, which means it's an upside down image. So the image that is formed on the back of your eye is an upside down image or an inverted image. Yet when I look at things, I don't th see things that are upside down. Okay? I see things that are right side up. Well, that has to then be taken, that energy is taken then through the optical nerve to your brain and your brain then flips everything right side up. And so when you talk about seeing, yes, you do see with your eye, but more importantly, you understand what you're seeing by using your brain, okay? That does go ahead and flip it then right side up. And so it brings that energy into and allows you to put that together and form an image. So let's talk about an image, okay, guys? You see beans. You see coffee beans, okay? Use your brain, and I want you to find me the face in the beans. Have you found it yet? Okay, guys, I want you to concentrate on the lower center and immediately to the left. And you'll find what appears to be a little bean down there that is really not. It's a guy with a really big forehead and a big nose. And you can kind of see his eyes. Well, as I said, you really don't see with your eye, you see with your brain. The eye allows that information to be processed and taken to your brain, and your brain puts it together and gives you that picture. So with that, guys, I'm finished for today. What we're going to do tomorrow is talk about the moon. See you then.